So what we have over here making a, an awful racket is, well, it's not the original IBM PC. The original IBM PC came out in 1981 and was the IBM model 5150. But this is the IBM PC XT, the model 5160, which came out two years later in 1983. So this is really what the first PC was like. You had five and a quarter inch floppies like we looked at in another video. This one's actually got a 10 megabyte, I think it is, hard disk and a very noisy fan. So I'm gonna turn this off so that we can actually hear ourselves. No need to shut it down in those days, although you probably don't wanna move it without parking the hard drive. Now, one of the things about the IBM PC, it was relatively expensive, but what happened was lots of people realized to get it made in time for the release date, it was just made up out of cheap, off-the-shelf parts. There was only one part that was special, which was the IBM BIOS, which they wrote the software for but everything else in it is cheap off the shelf parts. So the way we're going to look at this is over a series of a few videos, we'll actually make our own clone IBM PC. So I've got a kit of parts, which I uh, ordered from a company online that makes them, and they send you a replica of the motherboard and all the chips and resistors and capacitors and other bits of pieces that you need to put it together. So what we've got here is a replica of the IBM PC motherboard and it has on it, if I unwrap it, yes, we are making an unboxing video. So this is the motherboard for the computer, completely unpopulated. And what we've got are along here are five, what became known as ISA slots. And this is where you put in peripheral cards which control things like your display. So you'd have a display card, you'd have a card to control your floppy drive, a card to talk to the printer, a card to talk to your hard drive, etc. Unlike Many computers at the time, this didn't have any video support built into it. It didn't have any printer support and so on. They all came from external cards. Interestingly, what the original PC did have, but then was taken out for later ones, had support for a tape player. So you could plug in a five pin socket, it was used on hi-fis and things at the time, and load things in and off tape, and it could boot straight into basic. But we can look at the motherboard and we can start to see where things go, and I'll refer to the actual chips we've got here. Let's start with the most interesting one, the Intel 8080 CPU here. We've got the actual processor here. This is a chip that's at the heart of the PC. And your modern computer today, whether it's a PC or a Mac, will boot up sort of thinking it's a bit like one of these. You can run all the software that ran on here on a modern PC. It all descends from this. This itself was a descendant from the 8080. It's an interesting chip because it's more of a 16-bit than an 8-bit chip, which is odd at the time but it still had what we call an 8-bit data bus. So there's still only eight lines that could talk to the memory or the peripherals and things. So what else have we got on here? Well, we've got space for the peripheral cards and we've got space here for where the BIOS goes. We've got a clone of it here. This chip here was the thing that made the IBM PC an IBM PC. And so when people wanted to clone it, they can clone the hardware without any problems. They could copy the software off the chip without any issues at all, but it was copyrighted IBM. You could pirate it, you could build your own hobbyist style and then copy it off your mate's IBM PC when he wasn't looking and then build your own. But if you wanted to sell it, you'd be sued for copyright by IBM and they were quite big with rather effective lawyers, so you probably didn't want to do that. So what people had to do is if they wanted to build their own clone, was he had to get someone to sit and go through byte by byte by byte, understanding how the um, chip worked, how the BIOS worked, how the source code needed to be written, and then work out what the specification was. And then that person was then considered dirty. They had seen the source code. They couldn't go off and write the source code for a new BIOS because the, they could be accused of copying it. So you'd write a specification for how the BIOS worked and then gave it to someone else and they would read the specification and think, right, I need to write a disk driver that works like this. I need to sort this thing out. I need to set things up in this way. And they'd write their own code, having never looked at the IBM PC's original BIOS. To do it. And of course, you can see this fictionalized in the TV series, Holton Catch Fire. This might be a question that's outside the scope of, of this quick uh, unboxing video, mm -hmm. but is there a way of explaining what BIOS is? So what is the BIOS? Good question. The BIOS stands for the Basic Input Output System. When the computer switches on, it has to run some code. And the way a CPU does that, depending on the CPU, it'll generally either start executing code from a specific location in memory, or it'll look in a specific location in memory to find out where to start executing the code. And the BIOS is the very first piece of code that's run when your computer boots up. So when you switch on a computer today, whether it's a Mac, a PC, any one of these old ones that are around me, 
they will all run their own bit of startup code. And this is referred to as the BIOS on a PC. What it does is it provides enough support to do very simple things like printing strings on the screen. Remember, it doesn't know what sort of screen it's got, whether it's got a green screen display like the one we had over there, or you could get a color display like you've got on the modern one, but it knows how to talk to those things in a specific way. So it knows how to do very basic things like read from the keyboard, output to the screen, load files from the disk, drive the hard disk, drive the floppies. It doesn't know how the data is stored on this, but it knows how to get a, a specific sector when asked. And it'll probably have some code in there that says, OK, when I start on a PC BIOS, go to the first disk that's configured and start loading in the operating system from there. So it'll go and load up the first sector normally on the disk, and that will contain some more code that will then load in the rest of the operating system. And then you can actually start to get, in this case, it would be to DOS, which was written by Microsoft. And to IBM Surprise, I think, they started licensing PC DOS, as it was called on the IBM, as MS-DOS to everyone else who wanted to build a clone. I'm going for it with a contentious question. Why do some people say that this is a PC, but say a Mac isn't a PC? So this is an interesting question. At the time, the term personal computer was in use to refer to computers that people used rather than big mainframe computers that people like Dave used. These are computers you would sit on your desk and interact with personally, whether it was a sort of PC as we know it now, or more of a sort of hobbyist hardware thing like Steve Ferber had sitting on his shelf. That's the first computer I built, yes. Was that in kit form or did you...? Uh... No, no, it's entirely home design. When I got my first Sinclair ZX Spectrum, the box described it as a personal computer. But over time, we've tended to use PC to refer to the computer that's compatible with the IBM that runs DOS, or now Windows, whereas we'd refer to a Mac as being a Mac because it originally started off with a very different architecture. But even that ran the same architecture as something like the Atari. Even now, the PC thing persists. Do you think that's just because of the size of the company IBM were at the time they brought this machine out? Possibly. I think people got used to PCs being IBM. And of course, the old adage used to be that no one ever got fired for buying IBM. And so people got used to the PC in their office, which wasn't IBM. And so it's just colloquially got to be in that in the same way that we refer to other things like uh, vacuum cleaners are referred to as Hoover's even though they're probably not made by Hoover, but by Dyson these days. Ended up selling huge numbers of them to a, a bunch of computer enthusiasts, basically. And they, actually, not so much computer enthusiasts. They weren't at that time. They were electronics enthusiasts. They didn't know they were computer enthusiasts until this thing had hit. So, um, yeah, uh, and uh, it sold a lot more than expected. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mitt's